welcome to the uh, human res uh, to the 10 hour course on uh, human resources management being offered by iit khadakpur my name is aradhana malik course is designed to uh, alert you to show you uh, to make you aware of uh, the basic principles in human resources management uh, uh, the sources that i will be using for this course are listed on the first slide uh, they are uh, this book by Briscoe called International Human Resource Management Policies and Practices for Multinational Enterprises. Then there is a book by Cascio, and then uh, there is a uh, book by Gomez Mejia, Balkin and Cardi. Then there is another book by Pandey and Bashak. So, these books will be used for your course in human resources management. The topics that I will be covering in this course are uh, functions of HRM, the uh, role of human resource management, uh, human resource planning and recruitment, employee testing, selection, interviewing candidates, performance appraisals, uh, performance management and the appraisal process, training and development and managing careers. So, in brief I will show you what human resources are. some basic concepts. <coughs> human resources HR, human resources consist of people who work in an organization. That is what Gomez, Mejia, Balkin and Cardi feel. Now, why do not you discuss amongst yourselves whether the above should be called personnel or human resources and why? What is the term that would make more sense to you? what is the term that would make that would feel better and I will explain the differences between these two terms in a few minutes from now. Mm -hmm. So, please discuss amongst yourselves whether this term should be personnel management or human resources management because we are essentially discussing the people who work in an organization. Now, another basic concept that I would like you to focus on is manager. Belkin, uh, Gomez Mejia, Belkin and Cardi feel that a manager is a person who is in charge of others and is responsible for the timely and correct execution of actions that promote his or her unit's success. Is a manager somebody who gets the work done by other people or is a manager somebody who takes responsibility for the work that she or he gets done? by people or delegates to the people who are responding to her or him. The other concept I would like you to focus on is line employee. Uh, Gomez Mejia, Balkin and Cardi feel that a line employee is an employee who is involved directly in producing the company's goods or services. According to them, a line employee is the person who actually does the job. Everybody else is managing the job, but a line employee is somebody who is really taking care of the work that needs to be taken care of. A staff employee is a person who supports the line employee, which means these are the people who give them whatever they need to do their work properly. Okay? Evolution. Where did this whole concept of human resources management come from? Uh, <coughs> the earliest recorded accounts of human resources management are from 1800 BC, where the again the historians have discovered documentation of all this and they say that they have records of the minimum wage rate and incentive wage plan introduced in the Babylonian code of Hammurabi. So, this th these are the earliest found documents of the concept of human resources management in organizations. The term may be new, but the concept is ages old. The concept is probably as old 
as the concept of business, as the concept of commerce, as the concept of give and take in human in human societies. So, in uh, 300 BC, then another recorded account of the evolution of human resources practices are uh, from Kautilya's Arthashastra from 300 BC, 300 years before Christ, which is this is 2000, the year 2000. So, this is 2300 years ago, more than 2300 years ago. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, this happened in India, and uh, so you know, this was found uh, by the Indian historians. And in India, the history of human resources management or the recorded accounts of the history of the study of human resources management dates back to the 1920s, where there was an interest in management as a discipline among academicians. In 1931, the government intervened to protect the interests of workers through the appointment of labor welfare officers. This was the pre-independence era. This was the time when the British were still in the country and we were trying to get them to leave. And this was the time when we were in addition to forcing the British to leave our country, we were trying to take care of the employees who were serving our businesses. So, the government intervened and they said that every organization should have labor welfare officers who should take care of the interests of workers. In 1948, as soon as India gained its independence, the one of the first things that was put in place was the Factories Act, which insisted, which emphasized on the need for the appointment of labor welfare officers in every single organization. So, our uh, the people who developed our constitution, our lawmakers realized that in order to help a country overcome the problems that the British accession had left behind, that uh, the partition had left behind, they needed somebody, they needed to take steps to ensure that the people who were actually working in these factories day and night were looked after. So, because of that, this Factories Act was put in place. Okay. Uh, <coughs> from the 19, from 1948 to the 1970s, for about 25 to 30 years, this Act looked after the <coughs> interests of the workers in factories. In the 1970s, then they realized that we also need to look after the production, the productivity, the output of these people. So, there was a shift of focus from concern for the welfare of people to concern for the performance of organizations. So, in addition to looking after the interests of the people who were working in the organization, there was also a renewed interest in looking after the, in, in evaluating how much work was done by the people who served the organization. And that was in the 1970s. In 1980, National Institute of Labor Management and Indian Institute of Personnel Management merged to form the National Institute of Personnel Management. And in the 1980s, the personnel management morphed into human resources as new technologies came to be discussed to manage people and their differences. Then in 1990, the American Society of Personnel Management renamed itself as the Society of Human Resource Management. So, the concept of human resources, the focus on human resources developed and evolved as time passed by the focus shifted from the focus on welfare of the people to welfare plus what they produced, evaluation of the work that they did. <coughs> uh, 
defining HRM. About 50 years ago, personnel management was the focus. About 50 years ago, people focused on personnel management. They focused on the interests of, of personnel. Uh, slowly, the focus shifted from the interest of the people who were working to the productivity. Some differences between personnel management and human resource management. Personnel management serves a reactive servicing role. Personnel management finds out what has been done wrong, finds out or works on the interests of the people and what should be done to protect the interests of the people. So, how do we know that the interests of the people have been affected? When we uh, see that they are sometimes their productivity is getting affected, they are not feeling comfortable, they are not feeling safe. So, personnel management focuses specifically on protecting the interests of the people in hindsight. Human resources management on the other hand adopts a proactive innovative role, which means that human resources management essentially uh, <coughs> serves to be more uh, thinks ahead, strategizes and develops concepts ahead of time, tries to understand what is to come and works accordingly. In personnel management, the emphasis is on implementation of procedures. The emphasis is on, on working according to the law that has been laid down. In human resource management, the emphasis is on strategy. In personnel management, the, the personnel management is a specialist department. Human resources management on the other hand is a general management activity. So, people are really focusing on what they can do to uh, you know, since it, it uh, involves or it influences all the other departments of an organization, the emphasis is on integrating or looking after the interests of the people who are involved with different aspects of management, could be operations, could be finance, could be uh, research and development, could be human resources, could be anything. Then, uh, in personnel management, employees are seen as a cost to be controlled. So, the organization spends some amount of money on employees, on hiring employees, on retaining them, it pays their salaries. So, from the perspective of personnel management, employees are seen as a cost. You pay their salaries, so it is a burden on the organization. If you see things from the perspective of human resources management, employees are seen as an investment. And what is an investment? An investment is something that you pay for that pays you later. It pays you back later. So, employees are seen as an investment to be nurtured as well as a cost to be controlled. Employees are seen as a uh, as something that you pay for now that will give you a lot of returns later. Okay? Plus, of course, there is some burden on the organization. You are paying them their salaries, you are paying for their training needs and you do not know whether they will stay with the organization long enough to give you anything in return. <coughs> From the perspective of personnel management, uh, there is a presumption of union manager conflict, which means that a hierarchy is assumed in the organization and it is assumed that people at lower levels of the hierarchy will get together, will work collaboratively and as a collective they will be disappointed or they will be dissatisfied with the decisions management makes or their senior managers make and uh, from the and uh, on the other side it is also assumed that managers will not be comfortable with the demands the unions these collectives of employees are placing on the organization 
Human resources management on the other hand sees conflicts as inevitable in teams. Wherever there are people who are coming from different backgrounds, there will be a conflict and it will be dealt with by team members within their teams. Personnel management <coughs> focuses on a preference for collective bargaining of pay and working conditions. So, when people will get together, their interests will be looked after and they will try and get as much from the organization as possible. In human resources management, they will management led planning of people, uh, resources and employment conditions are stressed on. So, from the human resources management perspective, we feel that we will do whatever we can to protect the interests of our employees. From the perspective of personnel management, the emphasis is on settling pay more in terms of the organization's internal market. Who gets paid what? Which department gets paid higher? Which department gets paid lower? Um, every care is taken to ensure that the employees are not uncomfortable with each other's salaries. They are all paid at par with each other. From the human resources management perspective, we presume that people are coming to the organization from different parts of the world with different capacities, maybe different parts of the country, but they are as free to choose our, uh, our organization as we are to choose them. They are under no burden, no pressure to choose the organization that they are a part of. So, if we do not pay them what they deserve, somebody else will pay them and skilled workers will go from our organization to maybe our competitor. So, the emphasis is on competitive pay and conditions to stay ahead of competitors. We find who are the best people in you know we find out who the best people are to do the work that we assign them to do and we pay them higher than our competitors in order to stay ahead of our competition. We hire the best, best people and give them salaries that they would get from our competitors or higher salaries than what our competitors would give them, so that they are satisfied with the organization they are working in. And that is how we stay ahead of the competition. From the perspective of personnel management, there is we serve other departments or units. The department of personnel management is a small department which sends people to other departments and looks after the interests of only these people. From the perspective of human resources management, we are contributing added value to business. We are giving them the people we think can take care of the needs of this organization and we are looking after these people and we are also and in turn we are improving the quality of work produced by the organization. From the perspective of personnel management, we are supporting change. So, we modify, we adapt as and when change occurs. From a human resource management perspective, we do everything in our capacity to anticipate how we should change and stay ahead of the game and stimulate change. So, we become the change makers. From the perspective of personnel management, we uh, uh, there are challenging business goals in light of their effect on employees. So, the business goals that we come across are supposed to have an impact on the employees and we are supposed to challenge those business goals. We are supposed to change those business goals from the perspective of the impact that they will have on the employees. From human resources management perspective, we have a total commitment to business goals and we help our employees change and adapt to the business goals as opposed to changing or modifying the goals according to the needs of the employees. From the personnel management perspective, there is a less flexible approach to staff deployments. Whoever is in one place is supposed to be there and not move. Why? Because it will inconvenience them. In from the human resource management perspective, there is a completely flexible approach to staff deployment. People are supposed to be moving out of their comfort zones and doing things that they have never done before and it is ok. It is the responsibility of the organization to take care of their needs and help them 
go through that change as best as possible. <coughs> the HRM system. Now, what does this whole system of human resources management consist of? Human resources management can be divided into five broad categories, five, five broad areas. One is staffing, which includes identifying work requirements within an organization, determining the numbers of people and the skills necessary to do the work and recruiting, selecting and promoting qualified candidates. How do, how do you identify what needs to be done? How do you determine the number of people who need to do what needs to be done or who are required to do what needs to be done? And how do you find these people who can do what needs to be done in order to make what the organization is there to make, in order to do what the organization needs them to do? So, how do you recruit them, which means how do you bring in new employees, how do you select a pool of employees or how do you shortlist them, how do you decide that this pool, this set of employees is going to be appropriate, how do you select the best ones and how do you promote qualified candidates from within the organization. All of this whole big process is called staffing. The second thing that the Department of Human Resources Management does is retention. Once you take employees in, what do you do to help them stay? What do you do to help them be in the organization? What do you do to make sure that they stay in the organization, they contribute to the organization and they do not leave? Okay? And this includes rewarding employees for performing their jobs effectively. This includes ensuring harmonious working relations between employees and managers. This also includes maintaining a safe, healthy work environment. So, you reward them, you give them positive reinforcement, you make sure that they are comfortable with the people who they are working with, with their superiors, peers, subordinates. You also make sure that they do not feel uncomfortable in the office environment. You maintain a safe, healthy work environment. For example, in organizations in say textile mills, there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of uh, 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 fiber that is floating around and that fiber can seriously damage the respiratory system of the employees and that is not right. So, you take care to make sure that the respiratory system of or the breathing of the employees is not affected by whatever is in the air. There is a lot of uh, tiny fiber particles moving around or there, there could be smoke, uh, you know in say, say refineries there could be smoke, there could be heat and that could seriously damage or you know cause phys physical and physiological damage to the, the employees working there. So, you provide them with all kinds of safety gear to make sure that they are able to do their work properly. So, that is part of the retention strategies. Then comes development <coughs> to preserve and enhance employees confidence in their jobs by improving their knowledge, skills, abilities and other characteristics which constitute their competencies. So, you take employees in, you make sure that they want to stay, then you also help them grow. We are all human beings, we all want growth, we all want to do things well, we all want to uh, excel in our careers, we all want to learn from our environment. So, how do we do that? And it is the, when we take employees in, we want them to contribute to the working of our organization. At the same time, we also want these employees to feel comfortable and all employees come into the organization with personal goals. They come, they want to help the organization grow, they have to contribute to the ultimate goal and objective of the organization, but at the same time they also have certain personal goals, could be money, could be learning new skills, could be 
uh, you know, engaging in challenging roles could be, I mean anything. So, it, it becomes the responsibility of the human resources department to identify what they want from the organization and give it to them as much as possible. So, they stay engaged in their jobs, they stay interested in the company, they stay involved with the company's goals and they are able to achieve their own personal goals through the achievement of the organizational goals. Okay. <coughs> Next is adjustment. Most of the times we do not like what we do, let us all admit it. I am a professor, I am the only painful part of my job is uh, corrections. I will be honest with you, I am declaring this in a public forum. Uh, I love teaching, I love research, I, I, I like to deliver courses like these and uh, you know, but we also have to comply with whatever we are asked to do. So, when we teach students, it becomes our responsibility to ensure that their papers are evaluated. So, I also need to work on, I also need to read answer scripts, I also need to go through say 50, 80, 100 papers with similar answers to the same question. Every single time I set maybe 7, 8, 10 questions and during the examinations when students sit and write, it is my responsibility to read every word and give students credit for whatever they have understood and that is very boring. Teachers know it, but we have to do it. So, in every job there are things that we may not like, there are uh, parts of our work that we are not comfortable with and it becomes the responsibility of the HR department to help us adjust to these situations. It becomes the responsibility of the HR department to help us adapt to these situations to help us become more comfortable with things that we may not feel comfortable with and to help us stay within the rules. Now, as a teacher, I would like to teach whenever I want, but I have to go to class on time. So, there are checks and balances. I have to make sure that I stay within the boundaries of the syllabus that has been decided or I inform students ahead of time whenever I am making any change. I would like to do things at my own whim, but then I cannot do them and there is a set of rules that governs who stays in my class and who does not. I have freedom in the classroom, but I am also bound by these rules. Who decides these rules? The human resources department of any organization in any work. So, the boundaries, the limitations, what you can and cannot do, your jurisdiction is decided by the human resources department. <coughs> okay. uh, managing change is another thing that the human resources department does. It is an ongoing process whose objective is to enhance the ability of an organization to anticipate and respond to developments in its external and internal environments and to enable employees at all levels to cope with these changes. So, it becomes the responsibility of the human resources department to, uh, to find out where and how change is occurring and to keep pace with This table sums up these different responsibilities of the Department of Human Resources. Okay, some challenges. Some challenges of the Department of Human Resources. Now, first, the first category of challenges that any human resources manager faces is the environmental challenges. What are environmental challenges? Environmental challenges are the forces external to the firm. They are what happens outside the organization that affect what goes on inside the organization. The first one is rapid change in the environment. So, it could be the socio-political environment, it could be the socio-economic environment, it could be the technical environment. Now, so many changes are happening and they are leading to new company townships, new ways of living, people coming in, people going out, lot of mobility. 
um, um, you know changing family structure is leading to a lot of stress the demands on the organization to stay ahead of its competitors is leading to a lot of stress among the employees and all this is a result of rapid change how do you keep up with new technologies coming in all of this is affecting how we deal with the um, the change so and that places a lot of stress on us then the second thing which is related to this first point is rise of the internet many of us have seen a life without the internet many of us have seen a life where we use these big black heavy telephones where our fingers would get tired when we dialed phone numbers these big heavy black phones i personally have seen single digit numbers phone numbers i have seen the transition from single digit phone numbers in my hometown single digit to two digit where we had to pick up a receiver and we would get connected with somebody in the exchange who would recognize our voice after a few days or months and would first have a chat with us and then would connect us to the number we were asking to be connected to so one two by the time you know things in my hometown transitioned to the third uh, uh, say three digit numbers uh, we started using the dials and these were the big black heavy phones that we couldn't lift somebody had would come and put them there and we did not have to we were not allowed to move the place so <coughs> uh sorry so you know so that transition was very difficult for us and just imagine for people who were working these transitions were even faster the generation the people those of us who have worked or who have been around since the 1970s or 80s have seen this transition from a no phone era or say you know just picking up the receiver or maybe a single number era to a 10 digit mobile phone era where all you do is press one button on your mobile phones and get connected okay another thing is that this internet business has resulted in the course that i'm teaching you face to face i am recording this on the 16th of september 2015 because of the internet because of the change in technology i don't know when this course will be aired but because of this technology i would not be surprised if there is any value in this course and if it is still viewed in say 2050 or 2150 who knows it could still be around long after i have died and that is the big benefit that technology has given us i have to be very careful about what i say here i would not need to be so careful in a regular classroom but here i have to be careful about how i look how i talk what i say what i don't say whether you can hear me coughing all of this has to be a part of what i'm saying i can see the people who are recording this are switching between the slides and my face any time i need to take a break to cough they are switching now all of this is because of the internet because of this change in technology how do they know when to focus on my face and when to focus on the slides they have access to the slides they have access to me so they are constantly changing these things any anyway, hmm. then the other thing is that dealing with information overflow of course a uh, rise of the internet has led to a necessity for better written communication skills when we put something online we need to know how to write by default the people who invented the internet were native speakers of english so everything is happening in english if the person who invented the internet or because of who the internet became a came to be used uh, worldwide maybe if that person had been a german we would have been having this conversation this course in german everybody would have been forced to learn german or italian or um, chinese or hindi or whatever but we all need to one develop expertise in the language that is being used and learn how to write in that language 
dealing with information overflow many of us remember a time when to get one piece of information we had to go to the library and look at this big fat book called an encyclopedia and these days what do we do one click of a button <coughs> i'm sorry so at one click of a button we are able to get all the information we need and much more and we don't know what to trust and what not to trust the other thing we need to or we are having to deal with because of the internet is breaking down labor market barriers i can get a job anywhere i want based on my qualification so location is not a problem for me okay most of us are willing to move outside our hometowns outside our states outside our countries so we can go anywhere we want similarly geographical location is not a restricting factor for organizations we have so many people who have been hired from abroad one very good example of this is the private airlines within india in india a lot of people if you know we don't come to know how many foreign pilots there are but when you sit in an airplane say on one of the private airlines i can't tell you which one but you know and when the captain's name is announced you realize oh my god this person doesn't belong to india so we are not restricting ourselves we are not only looking for indian pilots even though india has a very large number of very qualified very experienced pilots but depending on our need we get people from all over the world and this is even more pronounced in bigger cities which is where a lot of foreigners are willing to come so maybe hyderabad maybe delhi maybe uh, bombay of course bombay has a very large population of of people from abroad um, uh, bangalore a lot of people have decided to come and settle down in bangalore um, ahmedabad to some extent so there's lots of people from all over the world we are not restricting ourselves and how do we know that somebody say in poland or somebody in uruguay or somebody in greece can help us do what we want how do we know this at the click of a button just imagine in this day and age it is not so unimaginable but i a lot of your seniors people who are around my age group would would have known this when we were in school and college even getting through to somebody in another town was difficult till the straight trunk dialing came in so the std facility came in and these booths sprung up all over india it was difficult we had to book a trunk call and wait for hours sometimes days to get through to somebody in another town or state and these days at the click of a button we can do a video chat i remember reading a comic about a tele picture phone when i was a kid that was science fiction that time and today it's a reality what was called tele picture phone at that time is what you do on your phone using the video chat app we had never heard these things when we were kids so all of this has changed and because of this you can find out which person in which part of the world is qualified to do what you need them to do <coughs> and you just have a chat with them and you bring them to your place of work okay <coughs> sorry using online learning so this is what we are doing that's in the, again a reason um, a result of the internet enabling human resources to focus on management so we are using human resources to help us focus on management to focus on the overall picture of how we do things okay we are no longer looking only at the interests of the employees we are also looking at how these employees can contribute to the organization and workforce diversity different people from different parts of the world are bringing different ways of working to the workplace and knowledge of human resources being well versed in human resources helps us take whatever they bring and apply it use it to get the maximum benefit out of their skills out of what they can do 
it also helps us understand how we can make their workplaces more comfortable so they feel inclined to contribute and they are able to contribute two things one is the willingness two is the ability and having a thorough knowledge of the differences in backgrounds of people and how these differences can influence people helps us understand how we can use their skills and potential to their maximum. <coughs> Another thing is globalization. Globalization um, means being able to stay in touch with people, being able to move to different parts of people, being able to consider perspectives of different people from all over the world. Okay, so, this is very similar to what I was talking about earlier. Geographical location is no longer a limitation, it is actually an opportunity for us. Geographical location is so, I mean you know we do not really think about where a person is coming from. We just uh, find out who is qualified and able to do what we need them to do and we call them and they come. So, the world is our village now. You know, it is one big large village, we are able to get in touch with people, we are able to find out what they are able to do and we are able to get them here and that has led to the growth of the worldwide company culture. We have people from so many different backgrounds, we have, uh, we are getting a pool of candidates from all over the world and that is leading to an industrial metamorphosis, how we view organizations, what organizations can do. Uh, what they can explore is, is really unlimited at this point. So, an organization that uh, was initially or started initially um, as a cloth mill is now selling vegetables or also into selling fresh fruits. Okay? So, it is your homework, you go and find out what is the name of this organization. You know, it started out, that factory started out as a factory that sold or a, an organization that sold cloth in its initial stages and now it is into petroleum and it is also selling or has stores that sell fresh foods. I am in the year 2015, so I am sure this organization will survive a lot longer and will be around for a longer time. There is an organization that makes steel, that has a lot of uh, 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 you know they, they, they make jewelry, uh, they make steel, they, they have, uh, they are into the service industry, they have an airline, they have hotels, so large conglomerate and so you know all of this has happened, why? Because we are able to find out new avenues of taking our business to different levels. Okay. Uh, then there is global alliances, we are partnering with people from different parts of the world. Mm, we, we are getting together with people from different parts of the world and we are, uh, we are adapting to their ways of working and they are adapting to our ways of working and that has led to globalization. Now, in order to, you know, in, in, in addition to this being an opportunity, it is also a limitation and uh, I will tell you in a little while how this is a limitation. Then we have a virtual workforce, we can outsource work, we can get things done online, we can get things to us online, we do not even have to meet people. A very nice example of this, I can cite a personal example here is that I am on the editorial board of an international journal. It is an unpaid assignment, I just help out my own profession. And <coughs> in this, you know as part of this work, I am sent a chunk of articles that I review, that I proofread, that I edit and then I compile all of them into the form of a journal and I sign off as the associate production editor of this journal. I have never met these people. I have been helping this journal for about 5 years now. I have never met these people in my life. 
but I have done a lot of work with them and for them. So, I send them emails, sometimes five emails a day and um, ask for their advice, get back to them, ask them to do things for me, they have me do things for them. We have never met. This is a virtual workforce. Whatever we do put together is up available on the internet in the form of this journal. A lot of journals are doing it. So, I am not here to publicize any company or journal. So, I am not going to tell you the name. But that is how these virtual organizations work. The global enterprise, we not only do things virtually, we also are not restricting ourselves to setting up our offices within one country. We are moving out of our geographical boundaries. We are moving out of our hometowns, out of our states, out of our countries and setting up an office wherever either there is a need or wherever we can get things done. For example, in India at this point in time in the year 2015, there are a lot of companies that have set up their back office operations here in the past 15 to 20 years. A lot of organizations have outsourced their back office operations. Why? Because commuting or getting information over the internet is not so difficult. There could be various reasons. One of them is that they pay, they end up the total amount of money they end up spending in India is much less than the total amount of money they would end up spending in their home countries. So, labor is cheap. People are very smart. Indians are very smart, very, very hard working. I am not saying people in other countries are not, but Indians, South Asians are known for their hard work and intellect and uh, and and uh, it works as a win-win situation plus there is a need for jobs so these companies are bringing in lots of money so we are also opening our doors to them uh, so you know a lot of reasons have gone into it but the fact remains that a lot of people have brought their work to india why because people can get their work done here uh, say maybe much faster or you know uh, uh, at cheaper rates or there are more qualified people here or various reasons. Similarly, there are organizations that have set up their operations, uh, you know the first level of their operations in the country where they get raw material from. So, they just take their operations there, take the raw material there, put it into or transform it into a form that they can bring back to their country and just put it together and make a product. So, we are not restricting ourselves. Then there is the wage competition. Again, you know that globalization has led to, um, you know, a, a uh, confusion about what kinds of wages to pay the employees. So, if you hire local labor, you pay them slightly higher than what they are getting in their home countries, but it could end up being much cheaper than what you would pay to the same people or similarly qualified people in your home country. So, you know how do you decide all of this is being caused by globalization. We know what our counterparts are getting in another country. So, we, we ask for competitive wages and this causes a confusion, but then again if we are getting more than what our counterparts within our own country are getting then that sort of stabilizes the issue. The other challenge is legislation. <coughs> Now, uh, legislation is a big challenge. Why? Because when you employ people in different countries, when you, uh, with all these changes, you know, especially in the case of international human resources, we don't know where the laws of which country we need to follow, whose laws do we need to follow, what we need to do, what we cannot do. All of these things are part of the environmental challenges. Then, evolving work and family roles, the family structure is changing a lot more people are feeling the need for uh, working alongside their partners. The traditional uh, working husband, homemaker, wife role has now transformed into dual career families. Both husband and wife are working. Children feel much better if both their parents are working because they get, I mean you know, it is better for the growth of their children also because they get very different perspective from their parents. I am not saying that single uh, families where women are homemakers are bad. I grew up in a household where my mother was a dedicated homemaker and I would not have had it any other way. Many of us Indians, um, especially in India, we feel that way. 
but uh, there is some merit also to to uh, you know the working women i am a working woman myself so uh, you know dual career families are on the rise and organizations need to take care of these spouses of people we are all human beings at the end of the day we are all human beings i'm not here only for the 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 challenge that this work affords me i'm also here in this organization for the past 7 years because my organization treats me like a human being i have chosen to stick with this organization to be committed to this organization to work for this organization because i am treated like a person a living breathing feeling person if i am in trouble my organization comes together and takes care of me in times of crisis my organization my employees my my subordinates my superiors come together like a family they forget that i am an employee they only focus on my needs as a human being and they look after me so well and that is why i am here and here i would like to bring up a very very uh, pertinent example of how organizations deal with their employees and uh, that example is that of the indian armed forces especially i don't know about how things happen in other uh, in the armed forces of other countries but as far as india is concerned i can um, you know i know this from personal uh, experience that in india uh, you know we we focus so much on personnel management we are we are emphasizing the the need for uh, employees to be looked after your superior your commanding officer tells you in the battlefield to go and die and you say han ji saab you say yes sir and you get, go and get shot in the chest and that in itself says a lot about how the organization is treating its employees would employees in say an outsourced company be able to do that no do they do it in the indian armed forces why because there is a sense of pride you're fighting for the country and the amount of care that is taken of the employees is tremendous right from day 1 you are treated like a part of this very big family called the indian army or indian navy or indian air force and if a soldier and by soldier i mean a person at any rank could be a soldier could be a um a junior officer could be a senior officer could be anyone if a soldier of the indian army finds himself or herself in the company of a soldier of the indian navy or indian air force they will still be treated like a person uh like a member of the indian armed forces you know you this is one big family it's like a big joint family and everybody loves everybody they take care of everybody so that is the again you know that's a challenge as far as private organizations are concerned but it's also an opportunity evolving work and family structure the people's families are looked after and that is the responsibility of a human resources manager to look after the interests of people treat people as people okay even with these changes and keeping up with this cha- these changes is a little difficult skill shortages and rise of the service sector people are moving out from the rural hands on jobs people don't want to be masons anymore people don't want to break stones anymore everybody wants to study courses like these could be seen as a threat to this big service sector but again these courses are important so initially people did not have access to these courses so those who had access became you know got more from society from their workplaces than those who did not have access today everybody has access so how do you bridge this gap a lot of people do not want to do menial jobs fair enough we are all becoming self reliant which is very nice but then again this is putting a pressure on the human resources personnel how do you manage jobs where do you find people who are willing to do the work that was initially done by people who were not so aware who were not educated so in this how do you train people you know what kind of training do you give to your employees to deal with all of these changes in the environment and there's a rise in the service sector we are we are expecting a lot more from what we buy we are expecting a lot more 
from the products that are sold to us. We do not only want the product, we also want service associated with that product. We are becoming super specialized. So, we are looking at skill shortages. We are the need for super specialization is increasing and we are looking at you know we want more and more qualified people, we are not getting them. How do we train our current employees? Do we find them outside? Will they be available inside? This is one more challenge that a human resources manager has to deal with on a day to day basis. The other is natural disasters, Malthusian theory, whenever the population of the world goes up, some natural disaster will occur and bring it down. I do not know if natural disasters are really occurring more or if they are being taken note of more, I do not know. But then if natural disasters occur, then a human resources manager also has to take care of those natural disasters uh, and look after the employees. Then there are organizational challenges. So, in organizational challenges, we have competitive position. These are the concerns or problems internal to a firm. One of these, the first one is competitive position. How do you control the cost, quality or distinctive capabilities of your organization? Huh? How do you control costs? How do you improve the quality and how do you still retain your unique selling point? And how do you keep retaining or how do you maintain that unique selling point? So, because of the information boom, everybody knows what everybody else is doing. So, it is very difficult to keep your progress, your growth path hidden. The other is decentralization. How much do you keep to yourself? How much do you centralize? Which decisions are taken centrally at the organizational level and which are given to the team? We will talk more about this when we discuss organizational structure. Okay. Downsizing, costs are going up, companies are becoming leaner, so they are cutting down extra employees. But where do you cut and where do you encourage employees? That is one big challenge. Organizational restructuring again, downsizing, right sizing, you know, shaping the organizations differently, self managed work teams. I will tell you more about it, but it is more about self governance. Okay. So, how do you monitor yourself? Growth of small businesses, you know, as new ideas are coming up, information is increasing, knowledge is increasing, education is increasing, smaller businesses are coming up and that provides an organizational or poses an organizational challenge for a firm that has been in existence for a long time. Organizational culture, you know what people are like, how they behave, attitudes, aptitudes, etcetera. Technology, we have already discussed this. <coughs> Internal security, what do you hide, what comes in the public domain, what does not, data security and how do you maintain consistency in the product and some individual challenges, different attitudes of people, different aptitudes, brain drain, empowerment, how much do you give them, how do you keep them motivated, you know, how, do they keep their job secure, uh, do they feel insecure, do they want to move on, all of these are some of the challenges of human resources managers. Now, I just want to leave you with one last thought. Okay. The better the match between the human resources strategy and the firm's overall organizational strategies, the more the HR strategy is attuned to the environment in which the firm is operating. The more closely the HR strategy is molded to unique organizational features, the better the HR strategy enables the firm to capitalize on its distinctive competencies. The more the HR strategies are mutually consistent or reinforce one another and eventually the better the firm performance. So, do think about it and we will take it from here in the next class. In the next class, we will deal specifically with faculty, uh, sorry, with employee recruitment and staffing and all of those things. But I, I hope I have given you lots of ideas to think about today and uh, come prepared for with in the next class. Thank you very much.